first man to come before the court this morning is State of Ohio versus Jeffrey M. Burks. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you want to let me know when you get started, if you'd like to reserve time for rebuttal, I'm keeping the clock this morning. We have read the briefs and we are ready to proceed when you are. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Attorney Neil Arnold, I represent the uh, appellant Jeffrey Burks. I request three minutes for rebuttal. <coughs> Yes, please May it please the court. Your Honor, we're here on the case of uh, Jeffrey Burks. He was convicted of four counts of rape and four counts of uh, gross sexual imposition. The assignment of error is very narrow. Uh, in this case, there are two young victims, uh, MS, who is age nine, and RR, who is age six at the time of the uh, offenses. MS testified, and both girls testified at trial, uh, MS testified that there was no penetration by Mr. Burks upon her in any way, shape, or form. And uh, her sister said there was penetration of MS. Or the sister contradicted in the sense that she saw that there was some penetration. So there was enough evidence to substantiate a rape by the jury. And we're not disputing that there was enough for a rape. However, there was also no DNA evidence uh, on the girl or in her clothing that indicated that she had been sexually penetrated. Now, the I argue in my that based upon a recent Well oh, wait a minute. You said it was not on her clothing to indicate she had been penetrated. Well if she was clothed at the time, what difference how would you know that? How does that have anything to do with whether there was penetration or not? Well I guess what I'm trying to say here there was no DNA evidence of Mr. Burke on the girl or on her clothing that indicates that he penetrated with a finger or a penis. There's no evidence to substantiate it other than the sister, the younger sister, the six-year-old girl, saying I saw penetration. Okay? So I'm not arguing that there's it's insufficient evidence or manifest weight against the rape. There is enough evidence. However, under a recent Ohio Supreme Court case, State versus DeWine, Wine that just came out in September of last year, and that cited 2014 Ohio 3948. That was also a case involving a rape where a man went uh, into the bedroom of his mother in law, lie down next to her, and then began penetrating her vagina with his fingers while she was sleeping. He, she woke up screaming and, you know, and all that. Um, he was charged with rape and he categorically denied that incident occurred. He said that didn't happen, uh, there was no penetration, I didn't come into her room. Of course, she said the exact opposite, okay? At trial, the trial court on the judge's own, sua sponte said, I am going to give a lesser included instruction of rape for GSI, sexual battery, and other things. The defense attorney said, no, absolutely not. We want an all or nothing on rape only. We do not want and lesser included jury instruction. Well, the jury, the trial court said, well, I'm going to give the jury instruction anyways. He was convicted of the lesser included, it went up on appeal, and it went to the Ohio Supreme Court. And the issue at the Ohio Supreme Court is, can a defendant have an all or nothing jury instruction? Is that within their discretion? You know, to choose that if they wanted a lesser included or not. The Ohio Supreme Court unanimously said, no. That is not your decision, defense attorney or defendant. No, the judge, trial judge, must give a lesser jury instruction if the evidence warrants it. Now, in this case, I am arguing, based upon the wine decision, the fact that the girl denied penetration, the fact there's no DNA to back up the penetration, was enough reasonably to conclude for a lesser included instruction of either sexual battery, <clears throat> sexual imposition, or gross sexual imposition. Any of those, and there was enough evidence for a jury to find on any one of those. Okay? Specifically in State versus Wine, paragraph one of the decision, we hold that a criminal defendant does not have the right to prevent a trial court from giving less included jury instructions. Whether it includes such jury instruction lies within the discretion of the trial court and depends on whether the evidence presented could reasonably support a jury of finding of guilt on a particular charge. Okay, and then they go on to say, 
Paragraph 16. The cause is before this court on the acceptance of a discretionary appeal on the following proposition of law. Quote, a defendant in a criminal trial as a matter of trial strategy has the right to present an all or nothing defense and refuse any lesser included offense instructions. That was the issue. And the very next paragraph 17, they say, Wine argues that the defendant has a right to control whether a jury receives instructions on lesser included offenses. We conclude that the defendant does not have that right. So it is not a matter of trial strategy by the trial attorney to say, well, I didn't request a jury instruction as a matter because I think my client would have been acquitted on the rape, and I'm not asking for jury instructions. That is not within the trial attorney's discretion. It's not a trial tactic because he can't control it either way anyways. So there are two obligations here for lesser included instructions. One is, can the evidence reasonably support a lower one? If it is, it must be given by the trial court. And two, the defense attorney has no say in the matter. He can't argue as a matter of trial strategy or preparation uh, or defense, well, we're not going to ask for it and you know, we don't want it. He had no choice in the matter and the trial court must give it. Here, the trial court erred because if the girl herself says that there was no penetration, right away there's enough evidence to take it out of rape and put it into something else. Okay? And you have to remember, Your Honor. It's a credibility issue. That's true. But that is also for the, that is a jury function, Your Honor. We're not, just, again, we're not doing a weight of the evidence when we're looking at this analysis. We're looking at can the re evidence reasonably support a lower, less included offense? So, if there's no so evidence... You're saying it can't. I'm sorry, what? You're saying it cannot. What? Reasonably support a lesser included. No, I'm saying it can. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm saying the evidence reasonably can support a lesser included. And the reason it can is because the victim herself denied there was penetration and there was no DNA evidence to back it up. Now, what was the evidence the other way? The other evidence was the sister saying, I saw penetration. So again, manifest weight and evidence supports a rape, and I'm not arguing there's insufficient evidence, but I'm arguing because of the other evidence, the judge should have given a lesser included instruction, and I've gone through in my brief all the various types of sexual offenses that could support it. Now, what the state is arguing is why I'm misreading wine, because in wine, the trial court sua sponte gave a jury instruction, while in this case, I'm arguing the defense should have requested a lesser included. We're well, also arguing that the court should have done it anyway. Right, right. But I'm saying, that's right, the court has an obligation to give that lower jury instruction if it can be really supported. I'm saying, but beyond that, the trial, the trial attorney, he should have done it. I mean, as, a, as an ineffective assistance argument, I'm saying there was enough evidence to support a lesser included, and he should have done it. Again, it's not a trial tactic or obligation uh, to not request it if you thought, well, I'm just going to go for an all or nothing. I mean, here there is overwhelming evidence on the younger sister, and we are not challenging on this appeal the conviction of the rape on the, on the younger sister. We're only challenging it as to uh, MS, not RR. So even if this court would agree to me, he still has two life sentences for the other rape. All right, moving on to my second assignment of error, or actually my third. At trial, after the verdict came out, my client, pro se, filed a request for a, a new trial. The trial judge said, this is untimely. You have to wait till after the final verdict, journalized, before you can file a motion for a new trial. That is not accurate. Under the uh, rules of evidence, specifically Rule 33, it says that an application for a new trial shall be filed within 14 days after the verdict is rendered. Not after the sentencing, not after final journal entry, but with 14 days of the verdict. And the Ohio Supreme Court held in State versus Johnson that the time period for a motion for a new trial begins to run after the finding of fact reaches a verdict, not after the trial court issues a sentence in the journal entry. Now, the state is not really disputing that, but they're saying this was a pro se motion, and therefore the trial judge could not grant it anyways. Well, a couple things. One is that issue was not raised 
As far as I can remember, before the trial court, the state did not object to the pro se motion, and two, the trial court did not deny it on the basis that this is a pro se motion and I'm not. She specifically said, uh, it's not, I'm not going to grant it simply because you didn't properly file it in a proper manner. So we would argue that the state has waived any argument as to the pro se filing of my client. Finally, as to the last assignment of error, because of the nature of the offense, there had to be a sexual violent predator here. The statute specifically allows a jury determination as to whether or not he meets the criteria. Before a trial began, the trial court asked Mr. Burks, or I think Mr. Burks voluntarily said on his own, I don't want a jury determination. I would like uh, the judge to hold a hearing on the sexual violent predator specification. After he was convicted, he then says, Your Honor, I want a jury. And he did this pro se again. He says, I want a jury to determine the violent, sexual violent predator specification. And the state, the judge said, well, one, you've already waived it. Because at the beginning of trial, you said you were okay with me handling it. And two, I've already discharged the jury. The jury's done and gone. I told, released them from their obligations not to discuss the case or mention it. And it, it would be unholy burdensome at this point. So I'm going to deny your motion. She held a hearing, and she <clears> found him guilty of the sexual violent predator specification. On appeal, I'm arguing a pure question of law that was his waiver proper? Was it knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily made? And he actually argued the second time around that my waiver wasn't effective as to law. I would argue, Your Honor, in order to have a waiver of your right to a jury, there has to be certain requirements that must be met under the statute, specifically 2971.02. It has to be, in, to conduct a trial court to have the hearing, it must be a writing in the record. Under 2945.05, if there's going to be a waiver, it has to be in writing, signed by the defendant, filed in the cause, made part of the record. None of that was done. It was simply verbal, which the court accepted. So, Counsel, you just now reached again your three minutes. Thank you. Time. So I would argue his waiver was ineffective because it wasn't done according to statute for a waiver of such a right. And we would ask in that situation that because there was no waiver, the court had to hold it before a jury, and it was not done, that has to be reversed and vacated. And I'll reserve the balance of my time. Thank you. I may please the court, Richard Cassay, representing the state of Ohio in this case. I'll start with the, uh, the sexually violent predator specification issue. After the jury returned its verdicts, Mr. Burks filed a plethora of pro se motions. Now, the law from this district is that where the court, where the trial court ignores such a motion, this court will do the same. He has no right to file pro se motions. He has no right to hybrid representation. Whether or not the state made that point in the trial court, in my view, does not matter. In effect, those pro se motions were things that the trial court could, choo could choose to look at as a nullity. And it's clear that what was, what was going on here, the trial court made a specific finding that Mr. Burks, in conjunction with Mr. Leroy McIntyre over in the county jail, was doing this purely for purposes of delay. That's a specific finding by the trial court. As far as the motion for new trial is concerned, again, uh, that motion was nothing the trial court needed to even look at. Uh, as far as what is or isn't in the record, uh, I believe it's State versus Pagler that allows this court to make a decision if the grounds for that decision are evident in the record. Here it's evident this was a pro se motion filed purely for purposes of delay. Uh, even if it were timely filed and properly filed, uh, Mr. Burks makes no cogent argument on appeal why the denial, if it was denied, was prejudicial. So in the state's view, there's nothing to that assignment of error. Going to the specification, Mr. Burks made his choice. The statute allows him to choose court 
or jury. He chose the court. There is absolutely nothing in the record indicating that that choice was not knowing, intelligent, and voluntary. Mr. Burks, again, in, in cahoots with Mr. McIntyre, uh, filed another pro se motion after the jury had been discharged, saying, well, wait a minute. As a matter of law, I could not choose what the statute expressly, expressly allows me to choose. This is how foolish this was in the court. The case law, now the argument on appeal is, well, there's two arguments. Uh, one of them Mr. Agarwal addresses and the other one doesn't. Uh, what he does address is there has to be a formal jury trial waiver. Case law is that there does not have to be a formal jury trial waiver. One case I cited is State versus Oldham, and the Supreme Court, I think, in the Clayton case spoke to that, and they basically, the Supreme Court said, we hardly even understand the argument when you had a jury trial on the main offense, and now you say you want a jury, uh, you, have to, you need a jury waiver on the specification. They couldn't even understand the argument. But the case law is that no formal jury trial waiver is required. Mr. Agarwal's other main argument, the one that he doesn't address, but one I want to, is uh, the Aline case, uh, another case from the United States Supreme Court uh, following the, uh, Sixth, the Sixth Amendment line of cases where juries have to make decisions, certain decisions, and not judges. Uh, the case law in Ohio is that a lien does not apply to prior specifications. That's directly from the Ohio Supreme Court. This court has followed that. When you look at the statute on sexually violent predator specifications, and I put it in my brief, uh, it is replete with references to prior convictions. So the state's argument is that a lien does not have any application to that statute unless and until the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, decides that that line of cases uh, applies to prior convictions. As of now, it does not. Now, moving on to the wine issue. Mr. Agarwal gave a very good and very competent recitation and explanation of wine for the most part. Then he made a mistake. He said that wine holds that the trial court must give the lesser included instruction. Wine says no such thing. What they do say, and this is paragraphs 30, 31, where the defendant waives the error in the trial court not instructing on a lesser included offense, he cannot claim plain error or ineffective assistance on appeal. But that's exactly what Mr. Agarwal is trying to do. The defendant's tactical decision. Now the foundation for all of this is the decision by trial counsel whether or not to request an instruction on a lesser included offense is a matter of trial strategy. That's State versus Andrews from this court. And the Supreme Court then, the defendant's tactical decision is respected and there's no manifest injustice. Wine is completely different from this case. In this case, Mr. Burks didn't want the lesser instruction. The state didn't want it. The trial court never indicated that it was even contemplating the thought of giving the lesser included instruction. Wine is different. Know, how do we know that? Where is that in it's not in, it, because it is not in the record, Your Honor. There's no request by Mr. Burks. There's no request by Mr. by the state, and there's nothing in the record indicating that the trial court contemplated that action. So it's not in the record. You conclude that they didn't want it because they didn't make it in the. I am concluding the that the absence of anything in the record as there is in wine, indicates, as far as this court is concerned, that the trial court did, the trial court did not say, I am thinking about, or I want to, or what do you think about an instruction on lesser included offenses. To me, that's plain as day. The trial court didn't do it, and the trial court didn't think about it. Wine is different 
the trial court over the defense objection, and the state re really was just a bystander. The trial court said, I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. And the Supreme Court upheld that. That's completely different from this case where the trial court makes no mention of doing that. And the Supreme Court <coughs> says the only issue in this, in the wine case, is whether a criminal defendant has the right to prevent the trial court from instructing on lesser included offenses. That is not this case. Wine has no application. What controls here is the tactical or strategic decision of trial counsel not to request. Now, was that a reasonable decision? Yes, it was. And we can, we know that it was for the same reason that Mr. Agarwal says he should have, because the, the evidence of the rapes of MS came, he's correct, came from RR. So it's reasonable for a trial attorney to think the only support on the rapes, although there's multiple GSIs on MS, the evidence on the rapes is coming from RR. So I want that defect or fault in the, in the state's case to go before the jury. You know, we can imagine that's a reasonable, uh, uh, a reasonable basis for the trial court, for the trial counsel's decision. And that's the end of the story. That's a strategic decision. So that assignment of error has no merit. Uh, if there are no questions, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, my colleague is saying I'm misreading State versus Wine. Your Honor, I'm going to read paragraph 32. A defendant's choice to pursue an all-or-nothing defense does not require a trial judge to impose upon the state an all-or-nothing prosecution of the crime charged if the evidence would support a conviction on a less-included offense. If, under any reasonable view of the evidence, it is possible for the trier of fact to find the, guilty, to find the defendant not guilty of the greater offense and guilty of the lesser offense, the instruction on the lesser included offense must be given. But I think the operative language in the beginning of that was, does not require. I mean, wine doesn't truly stand for the proposition that you are, even though some of the argument could be extrapolated from that, I don't find finding in wine, perhaps you can enlighten me, being truly advocating the ruling that you see as plain error and or ineffective. If, if I may, Your Honor, I understand that. The, the paragraph, let me, let me sum it up by paragraph 34 of the Wine decision. In conclusion here, the sole issue before us is whether a criminal defendant has a right to prevent a trial court from instructing a jury on lesser included offenses. We hold a defendant does not have that power. So we agree a defendant is not trial strategy. You don't have that authority. The trial court, after reviewing the evidence, determines whether an instruction on lesser included is appropriate. So here, the trial court did not do that. There was no, after reviewing the instruction, make a determination. The trial court must give an instruction on lesser included offense if under any reasonable view of the evidence, it is possible for the trier fact to find the defendant not guilty of the greater offense and guilty of the later offense. So it is an, I'm arguing, wine stands for the proposition that a trial court must look at the evidence and then determine for itself a lesser included is warranted based upon the facts presented. Here, as Mr. Cassay said, the defendant didn't inquire about lesser included, the state didn't inquire about lesser included, and the trial judge herself did not look at all the evidence and say, you know, she could easily just put on the record, I find that none of the evidence supports a lesser included, or I think there is enough for a lesser included, and clearly there was enough here for a lesser included. So I'm saying there were two failures here, one by the trial judge not requesting a lesser included, and by the trial, the defense attorney, he should have requested a lesser included based upon the evidence presented. So with that, Your Honor, I'd ask to reverse this portion of the conviction and reverse and remand. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation this morning. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a written decision, email to both parties, as well as post it on our website and the Ohio Supreme Court website. Thank you, Your Honor.